The Capitalist Unconscious by Samuel Tomsick. This is uh, part one of chapter three. Chapter three is called The Fetish and the Symptom. Part one is called Against Psychoanalytic Genera Generalizations. Psychoanalysts often refer to Marx in order to discover in his critique of commodity fetishism the attempt to theorize capitalism as a form of perversion. Such readings, convincing as they may sound, nonetheless contain several risks. They can, for instance, immediately turn into a fascination with the presumably polymorphic nature and adaptability of capitalism, while overlooking the problem of negativity that persists in both Marx's and Freud's discussions of fetishism. Such readings can add up to a direct fetishization of perversion. One can then hear that perversion manages to overcome the deadlocks of jouissance, to articulate a solution in which the subject assumes the position of the object, thereby becoming the support of the other's jouissance. One of the differences between neurosis and perversion lies in the fact that for the neurotic, jouissance is strictly speaking impossible, immediately linked as it is to castration. Lack plays the central role in the economy of neurotic desire. One can say that psychoanalysis discovered neurosis as a social symptom, a particular expression of cultural discontent, and an inevitable and inevitable collateral damage of capitalism. An example would be the epidemic of war neuroses that Freud discussed in relation to the First World War, and the entire argument of civilization and its discontents, in which the main focus is precisely on the proliferation of new mental illnesses under the exploitative regime of capitalist cultures. While in neurosis, the object of jouissance necessarily causes the subjective split Perversion is considered as overcoming this situation by inverting the role of the subject and of the object. As Lacan's formula of the perverse fantasy indicates, um, it has the formula in, but I don't know how I'm supposed to read. Yeah. This inversion presents the subject as the one who possesses knowledge of the other's jouissance precisely for offering him or herself as the object. We can find such a position notably in masochism, where the importance of commodity fetishism can hardly be ignored, and where the masochist contract directly mocks the law, as Deleuze has pointed out in his brilliant analysis of Sacker Masoch. Concretely, what masochism does is to caricaturize the law of exchange where it may seem that the voluntary victim let him or herself be sexually exploited and consumed by the master. The masochist would then appear as the ideal subject of capitalism, someone who willingly offers himself to the exploitative tendencies of the system. The moment of mockery consists in the fact that the masochist contract nevertheless determines the terms and conditions of the sexual relation relationship, thereby depriving the master of the position that he still has. For instance, in sadism, where jouissance is imposed on the subject. Hence Lacan's reduction of the superego to the injunction to enjoy. In the masochist contract, however, the role of the master is restricted. He is placed in the position of the laboring subject and its law is turned into a means of jouissance. We should therefore bear in mind here that the perverse inversion of the subject-object relation does not imply that the masochist subject, when it assumes the position of the object, becomes an actual subject of jouissance and thereby realizes the ideological fantasy of the subject supposed to enjoy. By occupying the position of the object, the perverse subject becomes the cause of the other's split, as is the case in the masochist character of the contract, which undermines the very consistency and presumable neutrality of the law. The situation is nevertheless more complex, and I shall return to this problem again in the final section of this book. Capitalism seems to comply with this perverse scenario. 
does not the subject of the capitalist mode of production, labor power, assume precisely the position of commodity, whose function is to produce surplus value, this Marxian name for the jouissance of the system? This inversion through commodification could be a possible departure for the psychoanalytic reading of, of capitalism as perversion. However, Marx's determination of the place of labor power in the production process shows that this perverse appearance is grounded on the mystification of the inconsistency of the commodity universe. The perversion of capitalism, this time in a strictly metaphorical sense, lies in the fact that the system imposes the perverse position on the, the subject, and with this move masks the symptomatic status of labor power. The abstraction contained in every act of exchange makes labor power appear as any other object from which surplus value can be extracted once it is thrown on the market. And if there is a relation between capitalism and perversion, then this relation should be sought in the already mentioned imposition of the object position, which means that every subject is confronted with the imperative to become the support of the other's jouissance, and hence the object of exploitation. The exploitation of labor is precisely this, turning labor into a commodity imposing on every subject the position of the object source of value. Capitalism is not perversion, but it demands perversion from its subjects. In other words, capitalism demands that the subjects enjoy exploitation and thereby abandon their position as subjects. Going back to psychoanalysis, the perverse solution of the deadlock of jouissance is supposed to be a problem for psychoanalysis, since it cannot be subjected to analysis or critique. Perversion entails a rejection of psychoanalysis, in the face of which analysts can only acknowledge the irreducible singularity of its mode of enjoyment. Such a position has unpleasant political implications. It, imme it immediately suggests that capitalism entails the generalization of the perverse jouissance at the level of the social link, an, insurmount an insurmountable horizon in which a thousand perversions may blossom, while the general social framework remains unchangeable. The closed world of commodity form, whose polymorphous nature enables the processing, integration, and neutralization of all forms of antagonism, the capitalist subject mocks castration, declares it an anachronism, and a remainder of the phallocentric universe that the postmodern has overcome once and for all. Castration, and consequently psychoanalysis, is considered to be merely one of those famous grand narratives whose end needs to be acknowledged. In the end, this position conceives capitalism as a vicious circle from which it is impossible to break out. Before passing to the function of fetishism in Marx and Freud's critical projects, we should mention that the interpretation of capitalism as generalized perversion has only a minimal grounding in Lacan. For instance, in the following ambiguous remark, where one cannot avoid suspecting that it was implicitly responding to Deleuze and Guattari's anti-Oedipus. What distinguishes the capitalist discourse is this. Verwerfung, rejection from all the fields of symbolic, with all the consequences that I have already mentioned. Rejection of what? Of castration. Every order, every discourse that aligns itself with capitalism leaves aside what we will simply call the matters of love. Lacan makes an interesting turn in relation to the popularized versions of Freudo Marxism, according to which cultural mechanisms neutralize the emancipatory potential of sexuality. Unlike the partisans of the sexual revolution who see in oppressed sexuality a positive energetic substance, Lacan insists that capitalism is grounded precisely on the opposite, on the foreclosure of negativity. Capitalism rejects the paradigm of negativity, castration, the symbolic operation that constitutes the subject as split and decentralized. Through this foreclosure, capitalism determines other discourses that can emerge in the capitalist universe. Psychoanalysis can prosper under these conditions only by adopting the demands of the market, reintegration of individuals, adaptation, strengthening of ego, reduction of disorders, strategies that in the end support the capitalist fantasy of an uncastrated subject, which would respond to the capitalist imposition of perverse position. 
Capitalism only tolerates a psychoanalysis that has abolished the central Freudian Marxian lesson, alienation as constitutive for the production of subjectivity and for the production of jouissance. The notorious neuroticization of desire, so heavily attacked in anti Oedipus, in fact prevents psychoanalysis from being integrated into the ideological framework of capitalism. Unlike perversion or psychosis, neurosis essentially is a subjective form of protest against the capitalist injunction to enjoy exploitation. The return of negativity in the guise of castration can serve as a minimal localization of the political dimension of psychoanalysis, although we should not forget that this return obtained in Freud a mythical narration. Oedipus, while its logical form followed under Lacan's under Lacan's theorization, um, sorry, I lost my spot. Under Lacan's theorization of the signifier and its subsequent homological development in parallel with Marx's science of value, Freud's sexual ideology of neuroses nevertheless establishes the correct connection between sexuality and negativity and even the, not the notorious polymorphous perversion of infantile sexuality, of which Freud first spoke in his three essays, cannot mean the foreclosure of negativity and the assertion of the purely vitalist and productive potentials of sexuality. The point that Freud addresses through this ambiguous and rather unfortunate expression aims at the discovery that all choices of the sexual object gravitate around a void where one would expect to find a normative model. It is at this point that Lacan's formula, there is no sexual relation, intervenes. After polymorphous perversion has obtained its vitalist meaning, we need to be constantly reminded that the scandal of psychoanalysis lies in the fact that it understands sexuality through the absence of a corresponding natural need. Capitalism does not want to know anything about the inexistence of the sexual relation and strives to make sexuality inseparable from sex which would be the commodified image of sexuality. The immediate conclusion would be that commodification simply is the rejection of castration. Lacan's association of capitalism with the operation of foreclosure is nevertheless ambiguous. The term opens up another alternative in which capitalism appears as a generalized psychosis. Since Lacan's aforementioned quote combines the psychotic Verwerfung foreclosure with a fetishist verlugnung disavowal. While the focus on disavowal implies that the capitalistic social link is constituted on a mechanism which allows the subject to avoid the intertwining of castration and sexuality, foreclosure attributes to capitalism a more radical confrontation with negativity. Generalized perversion could still be compatible with Marx's dialectic of fetishism from commodities to capital, while well, the second perspective assumes the position that the capitalist operations abolish the double character of production, production of lack and production of surplus. In this perspective, Joyce's writing becomes the privileged reference through which Lacan addresses the problem of psycho psychotize, fuck, psychotization of language, the dissolution of its consistency and the domination of production over subjectivation, the realization of the autonomy of the signifier, and finally, another form of the rejection of psychoanalysis. Based on this dramatic perspective, several prominent psychoanalysts have introduced the notion of the real unconscious in order to describe this presumably psychotic development. As already mentioned, the association of capitalism with the foreclosure of castration, rather than its imposition, leads to an implicit polemic with Deleuze and Guattari for whom castration is enforced onto the subject by the existing regime of production, capitalism when it comes to social economy, and psychoanalysis when it comes to libidinal economy. Lacan inverts the, the schizoanalytic perspective. If capitalism indeed strives to reject castration, it is essentially anti-Oedipal. Marx's analysis of the way capitalism mystifies and distorts so social antagonisms is clearly an important ally in this critical inversion. In returning to Marx and Freud's critique of fetishism, I want to start from the assumption that both psychoanalytic generalizations 
repeat the foreclosure of negativity, and end up fetishizing jouissance and the real, making the perverse or the psychotic subject appear as the incarnation of the subject of jouissance. In this respect, I do not find it necessarily correct to see a radical discontinuity between the structuralist Lacan of the 50s and the 60s and the quasi-post-structuralist Lacan of the 70s. Lacan's teaching should be approached more like a parallax that starts from discussing the unconscious and the autonomy of the signifier exclusively from the perspective of the logic of the signifier and then progressively moves towards the causality of the signifier thus finding itself on the flip side of the autonomy in question. Generalized perversion and generalized psychosis abolish the embedding of psychoanalysis in the broader philosophical project of the critique of appearance, which has determined modern thought since Descartes. The crucial dimension of this modern orientation in philosophy concerns the introduction of alienation as a fundamental philosophical problem and as a privileged entry to the theory of the subject. It is not surprising that the three central philosophical references in Lacan's teaching are also the most radical thinkers of alienation. Descartes, whose methodological doubt provides the first immediate linkage of alienation with subjectivation and at least the epistemological foundations for Freud's differentiation of the subject of the unconscious from the subject of cognition. Hegel, who extended alienation to history and becoming, and finally Marx, whose materialist turn exposes the strict equivalence between alienation and structure, thereby opening up the horizon in which psychoanalysis will address the intertwining of both aspects of the autonomy of the signifier. The two psychoanalytic generalizations associate capitalism with pathologies that are most often considered non-analyzable and represent two cases of the dissolution of the social link. The perverse subject may possess a solution regarding jouissance, but this solution is strictly private. The social link is suspended because the subject is supposed to stand in an immediate relation to the object of jouissance or offers itself as the object of the systemic enjoyment. The difference between the economic and the sexual fetish seems clear. The money fetish may be the privileged embodiment of value, but it is also the support of exchange. The sexual fetish, by contrast, excludes the economy of exchange and bends the the libidinal economy back onto itself. Foreclosure of castration then means as much as foreclosure of exchange, since there is no exchange without difference, which is for structuralism, psychoanalysis, and critique of political economy, the royal path to negativity. However, things get complicated even in perversion. Despite this privatization of the object, it would be exaggerated to claim that perversion stands outside the social link. The schoolbook examples of perversion, sadism, and masochism constantly demonstrate a social dimension in their phantasmatic scenarios. This is most evident in masochism, which presupposes a contract that determines the relation between the master and the slave. Even the aforementioned masochist mockery of the law does not suspend its symbolic power. We merely need to imagine a scenario in which the master would cease playing the role according to the contract and transform it and transform into a sadist master, hence precisely in the subject, assuming the position of the object cause of jouissance. Then he would no longer serve the masochist, but the other. The sadist cannot be the ideal partner of the masochist, as Deleuze already cogently argued, because he takes the letter of the law seriously and makes of it an imperative of jouissance. By making the law an obscene entity that supports the jouissance of the system, he corrupts the masochist's mode of enjoyment. While masochism is grounded on the abstract and neutral character of the contract, just as the commodity exchange is according to economic liberalism, sadism departs from the concrete terrorism of the law. Thus, when it comes to capitalism, Marquise de Sade's catalogues of sexual fantasies communicate a more accurate critical truth concerning the subject's relation to jouissance than the literary works of Leopold von sacher -Masek, whose scenarios of sexual submission only apparently outline a subversive position of enjoyment. In Psychosis, presumably the second case of the dissolution of the social link, the subject's body is invaded by jouissance, 
as in the famous case of President Schreiber. But here, too, the dissolution should not be fetishized. All in all, the Schreiber case is much more than a delirium, which would place the subject outside the social link. It is also an autobiography, which contains the subject's attempt to reconstruct the social relation. Daniel Paul Schreiber wrote his memoirs in order to legally demonstrate his sanity, and he succeeded, thereby rejecting the mystification of psychosis as an antisocial delirium. Still, it is true that psychosis exhibits some sort, of per some sort of inversion of the privacy at stake and perversion. While in the latter, the limit of the social link lies in the object, the small other. In psychosis, the same limit is encountered in language, the big other. The perverse localization of jouissance in the object and the psychotic globalization of jouissance in discourse destabilize the articulation that essentially grounds the social link representation and production, the other and the other. No critique of capitalism can be grounded on these two generalizations, which explains why today so many European psychoanalysts politically associate themselves with classical liberalism or neoconservatism, e.g. the alliance between École de la Cause Freudienne and the Nouveau philo Philosophe. Both readings, capitalism as generalized fetishist disavowal of negativity or as psychotic foreclosure, reduce the impact of the fact that Lacan's later critique of libidinal economy remains in immediate continuity with both the structuralist isolation of the autonomy of the signifier and with Marx's critical examination of the link between the autonomy of exchange value, the alienation of labor power, and the production of surplus value. Generalized perversion is grounded on reading Marx's notion of fetishism from the Freudian perspective, where it describes the subject's resistance to castration, a screen that separates the subject from its own lack in being. My guideline will be that there is a critical continuity between Marx and Freud. Freud's notion addresses more than mere sexual perversions, and consequently, Marx's notion covers more than the subjective misperception of commodities values and other capitalist abstractions.